So again, getting back to this notion of the pyramid, let's go back to the slides real quick. Uh, it's hard to imagine when you look at the second pyramid there and you see the top of it and how clean looking it is and then you see that it doesn't extend down to the bottom, it's hard to imagine that the pyramid was originally covered with these stones, that both of these big pyramids were completely covered and they were covered in such detail that it became like a mirror polished white limestone exterior. When you look at it now, all you see is a bunch of decaying stone blocks. I mean, yes, these are beautiful images, but perhaps the decaying nature of the pyramids again make it look like, oh, this is not really any advanced technology that was designing this. This is just something that primitive people built, and they really liked sticking man's head on a lion's body. We don't know why. Okay. And, of course, we talked about the capstone. So let's just start to break this down, folks, because I don't want to spend all day long talking. I actually have other things to do, <laughs> believe it or not. So the first thing that is very, very fascinating is just to simply assess the number of blocks of stone in the Great Pyramid. There are 2.3 million blocks of stone, and each of them weighs between 2.5 and 70 tons. There is no crane today that can lift such massive stones. We don't have anything. In other words, when you're looking at a crane, the crane needs to have a weight on it that's heavier than the stone. Now, have you ever heard of a crane that's more than like five or six tons? Probably not. 20 ton crane? No, no, no. 50 ton crane? Absolutely not. Nobody builds stuff like that. There's no reason to. They would be completely massive and we never use building materials that are that heavy so it wouldn't make any sense. You couldn't justify it in terms of its expense for building. So again, uh, the Japanese tried to build a replica of the Great Pyramid at one-fifth of its normal scale, not even at all a regular size, and they completely failed. They were not able to get the Great Pyramid to be replicated at one-fifth scale because the cranes are too, are, are too light. You can't do it. So how in the world could this be done? Going back to the slide once again, the total mass of the pyramid is about 6.3 million tons the conventional view is that, oh, it took them 20 years to build the Great Pyramid. Well, wait a minute. You would have to lay one of these stones every 2.2 minutes, 24 hours a day, 7 days a week, for 20 years. 20 years, every 2.2 minutes, you lay down another stone. How in the world are you going to get people to do this when you can't use even the best heavy machinery that we have today? And if you think about the mass of a human being, right? The mass of a human being, the, the heaviest human being is probably going to be 300 pounds, maybe 500 pounds, but probably in Egypt with the kind of stuff they were eating, you're not going to get anybody that heavy. Let's just even conservatively say the heaviest you're going to get is 300 pounds, okay? How many units of 300 pounds are there in a ton? Well, a ton is supposedly, what is it, 2,000 pounds? I think it's 2,000 pounds. So we're talking about even right there, just to get one ton, the mass of at least six people to push one ton. Two tons, let's say seven people, right? So two tons would be 14 people, four tons would be 28 people, and then they've all got to be able to push and create the full weight of their entire body as a thrust mechanism. That's not going to happen. Maybe if you're lucky, you can push half of your weight. So now you've got to chop those numbers in half. Now you're talking about a, a, a stone that's weighing 70 tons, where you probably need 14 people to push one ton. So now you have a 70 times 14 number of people to move one 70 ton block of stone. And then you're supposed to do that every 2.2 minutes, 24 hours a day for 20 years. It's not going to happen. It's impossible. This right there should be one of the big clues that this could not have been built by humans pushing things around. There had to be some kind of technology involved. And again, if we're going to get <coughs> a disclosure about the idea that UFOs are real and that they're anti-gravity machines, anti-gravity would be able to do this. If you could levitate a UFO and the craft and its occupants inside, 
then theoretically that means you've cracked the problem of gravity and theoretically you could get more levitation than just your craft you could levitate a block and then it becomes really obvious folks that if someone had a ufo if they had traveled from another place and they had come out here somehow then they would be able to use gravity any way they want they could take stones and make them as light as soap bubbles and that is exactly what i believe we are seeing this is the explanation that dissolves the skepticism and actually makes us take a real heavy look at exactly what's going on and where this is going so what i'm saying is we got to look at this in a whole new way we have to take stock of our of our knowledge and we have to see that the great pyramid is ultimately american too this is on the dollar bill our founding fathers took it very seriously they knew there was something about the great pyramid that couldn't have been done by anybody here on earth and especially in the 1700s i think that would be a lot more obvious so let's now go back to the slide i'm going to show you more of the things that make it completely impossible that the pyramid could have been built by anybody here on earth and you may not have heard of this but it is absolutely mind-blowing so here's the next thing the leveling of the base of the pyramid is incredible no corner of the pyramid's base is more than a half an inch higher or lower than the others so what does that mean that means that the here let's do uh that means that the pyramid is going to give you a, a, some a level of leveling in which to do this architecturally we would need lasers that have very precise you'd have to stick things in the ground you'd have to use lasers you'd have to have an altimeter so you'd have to know exactly how high off the ground you are and then you would have to calculate that none of the four bases are less than a half inch lot higher or lower now if you think this is just a normal stunt it's not okay because and we can say this quite emphatically there is this is significantly beyond the finest architectural standards of anything that we have today you can't do it you can't do it at all there when we build a building you might think that the building is aligned properly you might think that it's straight up and down when in fact if you actually go and you look at the four corners you look at the natural contour of the ground most of these buildings are made by construction firms they use bulldozers to level out the the land and they're going to try to make it flat but there's going to be some contour there so it's totally not uncommon for each side of a building to have six inches or even up to a foot or more difference in their height even though it looks like it's it's the same on the ground so for the great pyramid to have less than half an inch apart on all four corners when you're looking at this absolutely colossal object it it, it it completely defies the possibility of any humans building this and again why am i saying this now because they're going to tell us that ufos exist and when we get ufos we should get the pyramid almost a la carte it just comes along with the order oh well you get the french fries no extra charge the french fries is the pyramid in this case and the pyramid could not have been built by primitive people and the people in the egyptian antiquities know this but they're not telling us they they continually reinforce this idea that people built the pyramid with their hands using conventional technology but as i'm showing you this is impossible just because people don't weigh enough to be able to move blocks this large you would need a gigantic gang of people pulling that stone if you're lucky if that could even work it's very 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 unlikely the only thing that really makes sense is some sort of anti-gravity but then again it's not just about levitating the stones it's about the precision with how they were assembled how in the world did they build this building where each of the four corners that are very very far apart if you've been in front of the pyramid it is massive it it, it had to be some kind of laser controlled process it had to be or whatever is beyond laser a technology that we don't know because it's so precise all right back to the slide we also know another thing that is incredibly incredibly bizarre and that is that the great pyramid was built in the only place on earth that is the exact balance point of all the mass on earth and and don't worry i'm not going to lose you so just stick with me here okay what does this really mean it means that if you draw a line north to south 
and then you draw another line east to west. So the north to south line, okay, could be a line of longitude. The east to west line could be a line of latitude, right? So what we're now looking for is if you draw that line of longitude top to bottom and you go straight down across any one strip of the entire Earth, where is that line going to connect with the most amount of land? It turns out that you have to go from the North Pole down through Europe, down through Egypt, and down through the bottom of Africa. There is a line of longitude where that line hugs more land than any other place on Earth. It crosses that particular line, and you can mathematically determine this with advanced instruments. The, the, the biggest line of land mass crosses not a little bit off to the side, but exactly dead through the middle of the Great Pyramid. That alone should erase any idea that the people who built it were not a, a global circumnavigating culture. They had the knowledge of the globe. They had the knowledge of long longitude and latitude. They knew what the Earth looked like because they built it on that exact line of longitude. But then what's even crazier, and perhaps this is something intrinsic to the Earth as well, is that you can start drawing lines of latitude east to west, and you can also find an east to west line that hugs more land than any other part. Statistically, you can figure out where that would be. You just calculate, okay, how many miles of land are there on this latitude line? How many miles of land are there on this latitude line all around the world? It turns out that the exact place where the greatest amount of land is on a latitude line is exactly where the Great Pyramid is. And I'm not talking a little bit above or a little bit below. I'm talking dead on the money. So, so it's like crosshairs. It's like X marks the spot on a treasure map. The exact balance point of the largest amount of land north to south and the largest amount of land east to west is exactly where the Great Pyramid was built. And that is astonishing. That suggests, once again, that whoever did this knew what the Earth's structure was and deliberately built it there. And in works that I've written that are beyond the scope of what I'm going to do today, I make the argument that that balance point of the Earth's mass is also an energetic node. In other words, the new science that we've been studying that I'm going to talk a lot more about in Ascension Mystery School 3.0, Gateway to Galactic Mind, this is the class that's starting in two weeks I'm going to be doing it every Sunday right here on this set. Uh, it is a subscription-based thing. It's a lot less expensive than almost any other conferences that are out there of comparable material. But this is our big online conference for this year. I don't know if I'm going to do another one this year or not. There's a lot of things happening with the hover cars and energy technologies that are very exciting. And I hope to be able to talk to you more about that very soon. Um, we might be getting hover cars a lot sooner than you think. And... We probably could make them with conventional gasoline. There's certain plasma corona technologies we could do that actually they would build a, the, the craft would make a plasma corona. It would levitate by electrostatics. And in that particular type of anti-gravity design, you could make it work with gas. You could fill the car with gas and still get anti-gravity. We've talked about that. But if you have these other technologies that are really, really amazing that you don't need fuel for anymore, why don't we just jump right over to that? And that appears to be what we're going to get. And so a lot of people in the oil community are going to be very upset by this, but we desperately need this technology to survive as a planet. And I do believe the military knows this, and I do believe that this is why we're seeing some very, very interesting signs that they're going to give us a disclosure that might be quite an awakening for the mass consciousness. So getting back to the pyramid again, if this concept of the mass of the Earth, where you have a longitude line with the greatest amount of land and a latitude line with the greatest amount of land, it's as if the designers of the pyramid said, we need to build the pyramid here because we need that mass. And so in my other works, I've talked about how that balance point of the Earth's mass actually is the most important energy node on Earth. It is the navel of the Earth. And in another set of discussions that go far beyond what I have time for today, uh, there is a scientist who studied all these different ancient architectural landforms, and his conclusion was that they are all encoded based on the prime meridian 
which is the zero degrees longitude line not being in Greenwich, England, as it is now. That's why it's called GMT or Greenwich Mean Time. But instead, you put the prime meridian on the Great Pyramid of Giza. You put it on that longitude line, which is the logical place if it's the balance point of the Earth's mass. An advanced extraterrestrial civilization would know this. That's the most logical way to create longitude, not just because the British Empire conquered the world and said, well, we're going to make it right here, mates. Let's do it right in Greenwich. No, no, do it where the land's the, the most thick on the longitude line. That makes sense. It's, it's geometrically defined. There's a lot of really cool stuff about how all of these longitude coordinates tether to the prime meridian, and uh, that work is, is called the code, and it's one of the original things that Richard C. Hoagland came out with in his book in 1996 is when I read it. 93, actually, is when I started reading it, Monuments of Mars. So we could talk about that more in another video because it would be really good to bring some of that back now, and I probably will. That's a great idea. Um, anyway, if you're looking at this idea of the, la the lot of longitude line being ca capturing the most land and the latitude line capturing the most land, what is the probability that something like this could have happened by random chance? Believe it or not, it is one in three billion folks one in three billion chance that the pyramid could have been built exactly where it is and that is just absolutely astonishing definitely the people who did this knew that the earth was round and they knew where the zero degrees longitude line should be and they knew where the balance point of the earth's mass was it's like if you wanted to play that balance game if you ever did this where you take a little uh, thin thing and you cut it out from cardboard like this and you put a penny on each side and then you put a little point in the middle you can balance it on your finger and with the two pennies and everything if you make it about symmetrical you'll be able to hold it and it's a cool little balance trick for little science geek kids like that well this is like if you were going to balance the earth on your finger like I can do it with the egg here like it was the Harlem Glo Globetrotters right you want to balance the earth on your finger that would be where you'd need to do it so obviously this is going to have effects on geotectonic strain, uh, plate push, and of course there's other aspects of energetics that get into a science is way beyond what we're going to talk about in today's talk, but that's why I'm doing the Gateway to Galactic Mind class. There, there is an amazing scientific overview of ascension and what these ancient prophecies were telling us about the coming solar event. It looks like the sun is going to give off some kind of flash and uh, if you are an ascended being, if you have learned the lessons to be here on Earth, you get to stay here. And if you haven't learned those lessons yet, you are ethically transplanted to another planet. And you don't have a terrifying experience. It's very pleasant. Uh, you know, it's, 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 it's essentially your own ascension, ET contact. It's just you might not realize what's happening. So I do, if you look at these ancient prophecies, they all seem to say that this mill for grinding grain is going on, right? And, and remember, the extraterrestrials were giving everybody this, this grain technology. They wanted people to have this technology. They wanted people to understand how this really works. But the technology is fundamentally spiritual in nature. It is something that cannot be undermined. When you look at what that grain mill is really saying, there's a central axle, and then it's going around in a circle, and that is a metaphor of the Earth's axis. So you grind up grain with the central axle, and then you have this wheel, this millstone that's going around in circles. You blow on it, and then all the chaff goes away, and you're left with flour, okay? Everybody learned this from the ETs, and now they have storable food, so they're apt to survive a lot longer. When you're a hunter-gatherer society, you are totally beholden to whatever you can find in nature. You have famines, you have plagues, you have floods. All these kind of things that would never happen in modern times, of course. We have civilized society. Anyway, what we're dealing with right now is, is the grain mill having a central axle as a metaphor of this wobble of the Earth's axis. Now, the people who were getting these prophecies had no idea. They definitely did not have the scientific knowledge to understand the relationship between an axle and something rotating around it and the Earth but the ETs who built the Great Pyramid obviously did. 
So many of these ancient mythologies do actually build themselves around a grain mill. This happens multiple times in geographically segregated areas of the world. And here's the crazy part, folks. The prophecies invariably say that the axle breaks and that there's some sort of large explosion. And then after that, we are transformed. So that's the big central thesis. That there is a solar event, there is something that goes on that could be interpreted as catastrophic. It appears that this was how the ancient extraterrestrials told us to expect some sort of geological pole shift where the rotational north of the Earth actually changes. It slips by maybe 20, 21 degrees. And of course, if that were to happen, then life on Earth would cease. You would have 200 mile an hour winds. You would have tsunamis that are 100 feet tall sweeping across the continental United States and every other area. Most of the people like to live in coastal areas, but it doesn't really even matter where you live. Uh, if this thing were to happen, you'd probably also get the Yellowstone caldera exploding as a supervolcano. You're going to have uh, supervolcanoes underneath the oceans that explode. Uh, and the, you have everything on Earth basically getting buried under 40 to 400 feet of rocks that are blasted up in the air by the supervolcanoes and then come back down and bury the Earth and everything. Now, this happens over and over again on Earth. This is natural, and this is why when you want to find an ancient culture, an ancient civilization in their ruins, you have to dig down because they used to be on the surface of the Earth, but now they're not. Now, I understand how scary all this sounds, but again, if you are ascending, you don't experience a catastrophe. And even if you're not ascending, you don't experience a catastrophe, you're, you're relocated. And it's a very enjoyable experience. Uh, so the only people who might actually hang around on Earth to experience this catastrophe would be those who have invited it by the choices they've made with their karma. There may be a period of time on Earth where we get some kind of Mad Max thing for those people on that timeline. Other people who are on the Ascension timeline may actually appear to have left the Earth, maybe even for what appears to be many, many years, but they get dropped ahead to when the Earth is ready for them. So we don't really know. There's a lot of mysteries about this, but the modern prophetic traditions have, have filled in many of the cracks. So again, this all sounds very speculative, and I don't know, I don't know about this whole solar flash thing, but remember, every ancient culture on Earth talks about this. And the most common way they talk about it is with a grain mill, where the axle of the grain mill represents the Earth's axis, and then the axle breaks, and there's some sort of energetic event. And in these prophecies, people are transformed. That's the part of the prophecy where it gets mysterious and doesn't make any sense, is first of all, you're talking about this grain mill, and then it breaks, but now all of a sudden people have superpowers and light bodies, okay? Well, Santiana and Van der Shen put it all together. And as I've said in many other talks before, and I will be going through all this ascension information again in Gateway to Galactic Mind, what we actually see in the Hindu tradition is the acknowledgement of a solar flash. They call it the Samvartika fire at the end of an age, or they call it the Yuga fire. And there's many, many references to this in the Hindu scriptures. The uh, Christians obviously have the rapture, and most Christians don't realize that their own beloved religion is mirrored by all the others. That this is not just something Jesus said, this is something everybody was saying. And they told us about the prophecies of when this would be happening, when the solar flash would occur. They described a degradation in society, a degradation in the way that the world is running. And this is exactly what we're seeing now. The prophecies line up perfectly. We're going to cover all this again in Gateway to Galactic Mind. There will be some review. So even if you've seen it before, this is going to be, it will be amazing and new. I'm going to bring in some new stuff. Back to the slide. The next crazy thing about the Great Pyramid is that the sides of the Great Pyramid are aligned with rotational north to 0.06% perfection or only three arc minutes. Now, once again, um, this is a very, very bizarre situation. It is not anything that is explicable in the conventional viewpoint. How in the world could you build a building that is this perfectly aligned with, with rotational north? Nobody would be able to do this with today's technology for the same reason that you couldn't make a building where the sides are only an inch, uh, half an inch higher or lower. I mean, I guess now it's possible. 
but you would have to really, really get in there and like lay a concrete pad and really get it very, very level and have an extraordinary, probably a technology where you could pull a whole entire sheet across the concrete as one big piece and then make sure that, that you'd have to align the sheet with computers to get it so that it was perfectly flat, get the whole sheet across the whole concrete pad, and then just scrape the whole thing across. And then maybe if you did it that way, or if we had some other advanced techniques that people were using that involved individual laying of things, you could get it to work. But then again, how do you have that building then stand for thousands of years with all that stone weight and not have any one of the sides subside more than the other side? You see, it doesn't sink down. It stayed only half an inch off after all these years, which also leads one to believe that when it was originally constructed, it was absolutely perfect, and the half-inch variance is only the result of subsidence. That's what I would be inclined to believe. So this is absolutely incredible. But then... To take it to the next level and to see that like, wow, you know, we're actually dealing with something where all of the corners are, are not only that perfectly leveled, but they're aligned with rotational north. Let me be clear, all of the people who studied the pyramid have shown that there is just no way that you could have the rotational north alignment this precise. This, this is the entire edifice being so precisely built that again, it's as if you would need, like I'm using a 3D printing machine right now for, for some of our prototypes for, for hover cars and other things that we're working on. So we have a 0.2 millimeter filament length. So that's the tiniest detail that we can get. Now the 3D printer, the, the newer ones have a plate on them that is, that is perfectly aligned with the ground. So it will actually crank itself up and down like this so it's perfectly flat. It needs to do that. Then you have this digitally controlled head that's going around and making very, very precise movements, just fast enough to print the thing. Most of the models we're printing are taking 8, 9, 10 hours to print because it does it literally one string at a time, just builds it up thread by thread. So you would need something on that level of precision, of 3D printing, to build the Great Pyramid with these type of specifications where it's so precisely aligned with rotational north. I mean, it's, it's absolutely mind-boggling how this could have ever been done. And actually, part of the answer may be some kind of 3D printing or some very advanced version of that. Because if you go back and you read, like, Secrets of the Great Pyramid by Peter Tompkins, some of the old pyramid books from the 1970s, one of the things that you hear about is pyramid researchers breaking open limestone blocks of the Great Pyramid and then inside the blocks, they found things like strands of, of human hair. How in the world do you get human hair in limestone that's quarried from a quarry that is millions of years old? Where's the human? How did that human shed their hair and get it inside the limestone? But there's a lot of hair that we find inside the blocks. So many researchers, when this was really at its peak in the 1970s, and there was a big, big surge of it in the, in the 1700s and 1800s, by the way. We'll get into that in a minute. But many of the researchers that were looking at this said, hey, if there's hair inside the blocks of the Great Pyramid, what is limestone? Let's go back to that. How do you make limestone? Limestone is nothing more than sand. It's just sand that has kind of like a, a slurry that bound it together. So there's, there's a certain type of mineral substance, a liquid that has gone in and taken this sand and bound it together so that it makes rock. Well, that sounds a lot like how we make concrete, doesn't it? If there was a way to take a bunch of sand and 3D print the blocks for the pyramid, wouldn't that be cool? And then wouldn't it make sense that if you're pulling the sand off the surface of the desert, that people would have shed hair and your technology wouldn't be good enough to get all the hair out or you wouldn't really care. So then think about this. I was just hearing from a friend of mine that we're already starting to 3D print houses now. We're, there, there are, there's a type of 3D printer that's already been made where it's taking things like dirt and soil and then it's actually filling that in with some kind of agglomerating mater conglomerating material to make that mixture where the dirt 
is then turned into a block for your house. So, so you have a 3D printer now where you're 3D printing the blocks to make your house right there on site. So all you need is dirt or whatever material you're using. You're 3D printing the blocks and then you lay them on the house. If you had a very nice computerized system that is like the 3D printer, with I said that the tray goes up and down, you could take the sand, you could add something to it to make it into stone blocks, and wouldn't that be easier than actually having to carve blocks and move them? Now, the granite inside the Great Pyramid is, is only around the King's Chamber area, and it's a purple granite called porphyry. That granite definitely appears to have been quarried and moved there, over, I, I believe it's more than 600 miles of distance. So that, I'm not going to say, was something that was designed as a 3D printed block, but I do believe that the pyramids blocks were 3D printed in place. And this explains a whole lot of stuff, how they could have gotten at this, this precisely. In other words, you only make the block exactly where you want it to be, at exactly the size you want it to be, and you make it on the spot. You're, you're 3D printing it in the location it's going to go. Then you don't need to lift anything heavy, you just need to have a 3D printing technology. Which again is not that inconceivable, right? That's where you could start to have it be perfectly leveled, that's where you could start to have it be perfectly aligned with rotational north. Only 0 0.06 degrees off, but wait a minute David, didn't you also say that the Great Pyramid was at the balance point of the largest amount of land north to south and the largest amount of land east to west? Yes, I did. Are there any other things like that? Yes, there are. If you actually go to this next data point here, you calculate the average height of land above sea level, and then you figure out what that height is, right? Well, what we would do is we would use Miami, Florida as the low because that is at sea level. There's many places you could use. They just arbitrarily chose Miami. And they chose the Himalayas as the high, and this would be like the K2 mountain. So let's take sea level and the top of K2 or Mount Everest. In this case, K2 is a little higher than Mount Everest. So let's take the top of K2 and sea level and figure out what is that height. What is the difference between sea level and the, and the top? What's the, uh, so that's, that's the maximum height differential, right? But then what you're going to do is you're going to look at all of the land between the low and the high, and you calculate the average height of land above sea level. Well, believe it or not, the average height of all land above sea level is 5,449 English inches, which is the exact height of the Great Pyramid. It's unbelievable. It's, it's unbelievable that not only is the Great Pyramid built on the navel of the Earth, but it has the average height of all land above the surface of the Earth. Is this all coincidence? The more that we look at this, the less likely it is that that explanation has any weight at all. But even then, I have not yet hit you with the most astonishing thing about the Great Pyramid of all, and that is the infamous casing stones. So back to the slide once again. The Great Pyramid was originally covered with mirror polished white limestone, and so it, it looked something like this. Now this is from uh, a video game, uh, it is, I forget what it's called off the top of my head, but there was a movie made about it. Um, anyway, this is a scene from a video game, and I don't believe that the, that the detail lines on the bottom of the pyramid are true, where it was strips of, of darker colors. I don't think that part is true, but this is what it would have originally looked like. A mirror-polished, perfect white limestone casing on the outside. Uh, that is not the way that it looks now. However, uh, there are many ancient records that report that these casing stones were found. Uh, and believe it or not, up until the 1300s, people were witnessing the Great Pyramid as this gleaming white, shiny, mirror-polished limestone structure. If you've ever seen uh, interesting caves, there was one in... New York State called Howe Caverns, and I went there as a kid, and it has stalactites and stalagmites. And you've probably seen this. When water is dripping off the surface of a cave, there's some minerals that come down with the water, and they form these beautiful, beautiful pieces of rock that look alive and organic. And they're made from the water dripping down, and then the minerals that are deposited along the way, they're actually made of limestone. So those stalactites and stalagmites are limestone. 
And what's interesting about limestone, which you can see with the stalactites and stalagmites, is that the more they get rained on, the more water falls on them, the more glossy they get, the more polished they get, the better they look. And this continues to happen indefinitely. So let's be clear. If you build the Great Pyramid with white polished limestone, you have a gleaming white perfect surface on the outside. It's only going to get more gleaming. It's only going to look more perfect. It's only going to look more amazing as thousands of years go by and the rain keeps falling on it. Now, in the 1300s, there was a huge, huge earthquake. And unfortunately, what happened was that the pyramids were shaken so hard that on the second pyramid and the first pyramid, most of these casing stones just kind of fell off. And it created a huge mess, and they were all over the place. Now, the polite thing to do would have been to leave everything the way that it was, because there was thousands and thousands of these casing stones. However, the Arabs at the time said, wow, we have these gigantic pieces of pure white limestone. It's as if there's all this building material right here for us to use. We don't have to go anywhere. We don't have to quarry it. We can just steal it and use it. So that's what they did. It's very sad, but all of those fallen white limestone pieces were hauled off and carved up and quarried and used to build beautiful mosques in, in Cairo. So we don't get to see most of this anymore. And in fact, the ancient rich in, written legends of these casing stones were then dismissed as mythology. And this is the way that things have been going for a long, long time, from the 1300s onward. And people didn't even believe anymore that the pyramid ever had these casing stones. And it's, it's easy to understand why, because it's so fantastic. It so defies any type of common sense or logic to think that the pyramid would have looked like this, that people just say, oh, well, you know, come on. I mean, it's primitive people built it. It couldn't have looked like that. That's too amazing. That's too perfect. It never would have happened. Well, that, w that became the prevailing academic view. And so all throughout the 1970, throughout the 1700s rather, throughout the 1700s into the 1800s, if you tried to argue that the pyramid once had casing stones on it, you were mocked, you were laughed at, and you were ridiculed. Now one of the people who was actually doing the mocking, doing the ridiculing, was Flinders Petrie. And Sir Flinders Petrie, I believe, or it might have been Colonel Howard Vise. It's one of these two guys. They, not, neither one of them I really like that much when you read about everything they were doing. But they did make incredible contributions. I think this one was Vise. I'm not sure, but let's just go with Vise. So Colonel Howard Vise, or Petrie, it's one of the two, actually didn't believe that the casing stones existed. And, and Vise in particular was a notorious skeptic. So he says... I'm going to scientifically prove once and for all that there were no casing stones on the Great Pyramid. How do we do this? Well, we got to dig out the whole base. We'll dig out the whole base of the pyramid because it was still buried. And, you know, because at the very base, the stones aren't going to fall off. And if, if there were casing stones there, then some of them should still be there at the bottom. And, of course, that's not going to happen. So then we can scientifically prove once and for all this is BS. Well, so Colonel Howard Vise's people did dig out the base. And then what they found was this. Sure enough, what you're seeing right here are the surviving remnants of the original casing stones. So you notice this is the bottom of the pyramid, and you see a wedge-shaped object where it is square on the back, like a cube, but then on the front it is a strict diagonal slope. These are made out of white limestone. It's a better stone than, than the surrounding pyramid. You can't really see it because of some of the weathering. But you can kind of see that it's a little bit brighter. And also the, the, the floor was made of white limestone as well in this case. So, so notice that the, the stones on the bottom are, are also the same color. So this is the surviving remnant of this. Here is another picture of this, OK? Now, this was a shock to Colonel Howard Vise and all of his pyramid colleagues because now they see absolute proof that all these eyewitness reports, of which there are many, it even goes to the Greek historian Herodotus, he saw it, Pliny the Elder, he saw it, 
there's plenty of reports of the casing stones and people witnessing them. Um, it, it goes on and on for centuries and centuries. Then we found these buried casing stones, folks. So we see them where he was expecting not to find them. Instead, they actually did find them. And that was, I'm sure, incredibly frustrating. Uh, so this is a very strange situation. What does it tell us? And where do we go with this information? What, how in the world could somebody have built the pyramid to look like a mirror-polished marble sculpture? A perfect marble white pyramid that's absolutely there's according to the ancient records like herodotus pliny the elder pliny the elder talked about boys running up and down the sides of the pyramid because it was perfectly smooth that they would run barefoot right up the pyramid and and people would tip them for doing it uh apparently also the casing stones did have some kind of written language on them there was an actual series of writings on the surface of the pyramid which apparently were copied down and they're called the pyramid texts and so the pyramid texts refer back to this time of what they call zeptepi or the first time and that's where you get all these illustrations on the egyptian tomb walls of beings that are not exactly human looking but are human like where they might be having a human body but they have a bird like head or they have the head of a dog or some other kinds of things uh so this is very peculiar the Zeptepi thing cannot be denied once we start to really unpack the age and the antiquity of the pyramid and how incredible its construction was how did it get to be like this how did it get to where we have these casing stones on the outside now let me point out something else the distance between each of these casing stones if you go back and look at it real quick you can just see here that and let's go back to the other slide too uh that these these stones are massive. I mean, it's, it's hard to see because you don't have people standing on it except on the far end. But if you look on the far end, uh, you see that there's people standing up on the top of the stones, okay? And when, if you look at that height reference in this picture, you can actually see, okay, yeah. So these people are not as tall as the stones themselves. The stones are taller than the people. So I want you to get that reference and really look at that. I hope you can see the people. Let me know in the comments. If you, if you can't see the people, um, somebody said, why are people asking if he has allergies? I do have allergies. There's lots of pollen here. I'm sorry about my stuffy nose. Um, <laughs> anyway, so these are massive, massive stones. Okay, they're huge. And when you look at the distance between the cracks of these stones, which are taller than human beings, how far apart do you think the stones are? Do you think they're... Uh, one quarter of an inch apart, one eighth of an inch apart, one sixteenth of an inch apart? Or are they even tighter than that? Well, it turns out that it's one one hundredth of an inch. So you have planes of rock that can be eight feet tall, six to seven feet deep, that are one one hundredth of an inch apart. The only way we could do this is with some kind of 3D printer. The idea of cutting those stones to be that tightly connected is ridiculous. It would take so much time, it would be so impossible. Why not just print it in place? Why not just print the stone where you need it to be? If that isn't crazy enough, Colonel Howard Vise, I'm sure, you know, and his people were angry. They didn't like the fact they found the casing stones, so they're going to do some destructive research. One of the things they did is they whacked on these stones with a big sledgehammer. And when they did that, around where the intersection was between two stones, they found that in that crack of one one-hundredth of an inch, there was some kind of mortar that holds them together. In other words, they were sealed together with a, a, a cement in a one one-hundredth of an inch crack. Now bear in mind, the best architectural standard we've ever used here on Earth is the tiles on the space shuttle. The tiles on the space shuttle have one fiftieth of an inch tolerance between them, and that's intended to keep people alive as they're fighting the, the burn of going through Earth's atmosphere on re-entry. These gigantic blocks of stone, there, I'm sounding a lot like ancient aliens now, gigantic blocks of stone, eight inches, eight, eight feet tall, six feet deep, 
one one hundredth of an inch apart, and there's a mortar holding them together, and when you hit it with a sledgehammer, the surrounding stone breaks before the mortar. The mortar is stronger than the actual stone itself. This again is exactly what we would expect to see if you were 3D printing these stones into position so that when you make two of them next to each other, the last step that you use is to, is to create some kind of laser or, or some kind of particle beam where you're melting the stone together, you're sealing it together. So you, you're pouring them into position, you're 3D printing them, and then you're sealing the crack with some sort of particle beam or laser or something. That's the only real explanation for something like this. So again, 3D printing gives us kind of a conventional, more easy to understand way of how in the world these casing stones could have been made. But that is just so amazing, so astonishing, like, what are we really learning here? Well, what we're learning is that this was not built by terrestrial human beings here on Earth. It's, it's just much, much too advanced. Okay, so back to the slide here. You can see the people standing up there. Now, just try to imagine the entire surface of the pyramid covered with these, and then an earthquake tosses them, them all loose, and now it looks like a big old heap of rocks. So the pyramid is t built in total of about 115,000 of these blocks that average 100 inches or 8.3 feet in thickness. That's the average. Much, much too big for people to be pushing them around with their own body weight. You, you, don't, you couldn't get all those people. You couldn't even get animals to do it. It's just way too much. Some of these average stones are coming in around 16 tons. <clears throat> Again, remember the, the Japanese could not build it at even, you know, one-fifth scale. The casing stones were so bright in the daytime that if you actually looked at the Great Pyramid, you would get blinded. So it was a blinding experience to look at the Great Pyramid, and they called it Takut, or the light, apparently because you literally couldn't look at the pyramid during the day. If, if the sunlight was catching it wrong, it would blind your eyes. But this also allowed people to see it from very far away, even all the way over in Israel, apparently they could see the pyramid when it was like this. So again, as I just said before, back to the slide, these joints were fitted so perfectly that you can't even fit a fingernail in the crack. The fingernail is 1 50th of an inch. And again, this is better than the tiles on the space shuttle. And I already said that the mortar in the cracks are stronger than surrounding stone. And we already talked about how some of these mortared areas are five feet by seven feet in the vertical. I said eight feet, I was a little bit off. The slides are more right, because I did this from research. Now, uh, there's other things that you need to know about the Great Pyramid. And I'm going to start to go through a little of this now. Uh, just, but I don't want to make this particular show a long, 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 long show. Okay, we're not going to do the three hours. I'm going to try to keep it short. But let's go through a little bit of this now. So let's talk about the pyramid inch for a moment. Now, getting back to the slide, the pyramid inch is slightly different than the inch that we now use in the English metric, well, not the metric system, in the English system, which is not the metric system, before the metric system. The, the pyramid inch corresponds to 1.00106 inches, so it is slightly longer than a regular inch, and, and just for the purpose of argument, this would also be in centimeters 2.5426924. So, what are we saying here? The Great Pyramid has this pyramid inch of 1.00106 inches encoded into its measurements. Remember how precise everything is? Remember the 1 50th to 1 100th of an inch cracks between the stones? Remember the massive precision of the aligning of the base and the aligning of the sides with rotational north? The fact that it's got the greatest longitude la land mass, the greatest latitude land mass, and the average height of all land above the surface of the ground, and that just so happens to all be in the Great Pyramid? Well, the precision doesn't stop there. The precision gets much more interesting when you start to calculate all of these measurements in the pyramid based on the pyramid inch. So what we're led to believe, and I'm going to show you all the science of this in just a second, but just so that you're clear on this, what we're led to believe is that there was exactly an ideal inch that was given to us by extraterrestrials who built the Great Pyramid, 
and that the actual English system may have been derived from these measurements, but that when they made the exact cut of what the inch would be, that it was 0 0.00106 inches too small. So you have to add that extra 0 0.00106 inches to make it the right size. So again, now we very precisely measured this original cut of what the inch was. People made a, a little measurement out of it, and then that measurement became standardized. So if the measurement was very slightly off, it's, it's actually kind of the same as the fact that supposedly video is 30 frames per second. We were just dealing with this, trying to solve the problems with this studio that we're having. We are still have major technical problems, but again, we're at least getting it to work. Uh, but one of the main pieces of equipment that I wanted to work today isn't working, and we have no idea why, because it worked fine last night. But that always happens. Anyway, the actual frame rate is not 30 frames per second. It's 29.97. And the reason why is that when they thought they were making it 30 frames per second, their use of the time quanta of one second was a little bit off. So it's not quite 30 frames per second exactly. It's actually 29.97. So this is why you have to have 29.97 frames per second to reach the normal broadcast standard. So it's the same concept with the inch. They got it a little bit wrong. The measurement was a little bit off. That's the one we've been using. The perfect measurement, as you're going to see, is in the Great Pyramid. But what also is fascinating is the idea that this pyramid inch is a better inch to use than the one that we've been using because it can be derived from the Earth's own measurements. Now, what do I mean by that? What we're going to do here is we're going to look at the Earth and we're going to take the pole to pole height of the Earth. We're going to look at it from the North Pole to the South Pole. We're going to draw a line from the top to the bottom. And then we're going to measure that line very precisely. Now, this, this isn't going to be affected very much, if at all, by any increase in the Earth's bulging because that's going to happen at the equator's area. So this is going to stay pretty much the same north to south. Well, what you can do is you can take that length of the North Pole to the South Pole, and you can chop it up into exactly 500 million units. 500 million measurement units, OK? And if you take the, the Earth's distance from the North Pole to the South Pole, chop it up into 500 million, those are exactly 500 million units of 1.00106 inches. You follow me? Now, is that arbitrary? No. Because anybody could say, hey, why shouldn't we use a measurement system that is scaled to the planet that we're using it on? In other words, let's take the north to south distance of the Earth. Let's divide it up into exactly half a billion units. And if those units end up being something that's of a useful size for us, then let's use it. Well, that's exactly what happens. The pyramid inch is precisely one five hundred millionth of the Earth's polar diameter. That is the result of extraterrestrials. That could not be a random coincidence. And anybody who thinks it is doesn't have enough ingenuity. The idea that the Great Pyramid was built with these inches as a measuring system and then the idea that that inch is exactly one five hundred millionth of the Earth's diameter on the poles is, is, is not a coincidence. It's a very convenient thing to take a distance and chop it up into a nice round number like 500 million and then use that as your measuring system. And it requires that you had the technology to be able to measure the exact distance of the Earth from the North Pole to the South Pole, which clearly is not something the Egyptians could do. So again, in a post-disclosure society, this is why I'm making this video. This is why I'm not going to make it too long. I want you to tune into the idea that this is really happening, that the Great Pyramid is built with these inches. And these inches correspond to the Earth's measurements, naturally. That suggests the work of higher intelligence. That suggests the work of people who knew exactly what they're doing. So again, uh, we're going to go to the slide here. So if you take this pole-to-pole -pole height of the Earth, <clears throat> you chop it into exactly 500 million inches. Then, if you apply this inch to the Great Pyramid, you get the exact length of an Earth year in the perimeter. Now, I'm not going to go into all the technical details here because they are extensive. But 
365.2422 is the exact number of days in an Earth year. And what we find is that 365.2422 is precisely encoded redundantly in the measurements of the pyramid, around its base, around its perimeter, and in other areas as well, including that there is actually a sphere in the antechamber leading into the king's chamber. And if you draw a sphere in the antechamber, it's exactly 365.2422 inches in circumference. So this sphere inside the, the chamber of the pyramid in pyramid inches is the exact measurement of the length of the Earth's day, the length of the Earth's year in days, down to the decimal point, for decimal point accuracy. Once again, it would only be an advanced society that could calculate that the Earth's year is exactly 365.2422 days. You need advanced equipment to be able to make that kind of a discernment. So that right there, when you see this Earth dimensionality encoded in the pyramid inch, which again is one five hundred millionth of the polar diameter of the Earth, somebody is telling us that the pyramid symbolizes the Earth. And another thing that's very fascinating is that you can actually draw a hemisphere over the pyramid. And sure enough, the base, the, the equator of a sphere will connect with the four corners of the pyramid. And then you have this height where the top of the sphere is as well. All right, so if the Great Pyramid is built to, to show you the Earth's year along its base, along its perimeter, and I don't remember exactly how it's done. I think it's 3652.422 total inches. I think that's what it is. So you get the 365.2, but then you got to move the decimal point and then that's the exact number of inches around the perimeter. I think that's what it is, or it might be that it's 365.2 inches per side. It's one of those two, I forget. But then, the most amazing thing of all is the connection between the pyramid and the precession of the equinoxes. So let's check this out. The precession of the equinoxes, that number is actually revealed in the diagonal length of the pyramid if you draw from the bottom corner up to the top down to another bottom corner on the opposite side that length is exactly 25,826.4 pyramid inches and what's interesting about this is that it's actually the length of the perfect precession of the equinox is not the ideal one of 25,920 years but the one that we actually measure now, this, this variable is much closer. So the, the ideal, if you will, harmonic precession of the equinoxes is exactly 25,920 years. But then if you measure what the precession appears to be doing today, it's much closer to this figure of 25,826.4 years. So let's look at this pyramid now, and, and you're going to see this. Okay. So I want you to look at the far left corner, which has the capital C in the far right corner, which is the capital A, and we're going to draw a line between these two points. The line is going to go up the east side of the pyramid up to the, the small letter C, and then you're going to draw a diagonal across that square base from s small C to small A. Okay, you draw a diagonal line, then small A to large A. That is the length that we are talking about. And so, if you look at it this way and you count up that length, it's exactly 25,826.4 pyramid inches, which again is very, very close to this strange counter-rotating wobble of the Earth that all the different ancient mystery teachings tell us about of 25,920 years. And then the mystery gets even more outrageous 